this wonderful question about the big questions and your personal worldview in seven minutes starting now is a huge challenge. Um, as I reflect on human life and as I look at human life being lived in the world as a whole and in my family and my children and my grandchildren and the society that I know and other societies of which I care, there are certain key features which everybody is interested in and everybody is puzzled about. And I'm interested in the universality of that interest and the universality of that puzzlement. And I've listed them uh, seven features as justice, spirituality, relationships, beauty, freedom, truth, and power. Now, more or less all humans cross-culturally are more or less interested in all of those things. And, and I think this is why philosophers do what they do, um, and by the way, part of my first degree was in philosophy, so I'm, I was glad to hear about Seneca and people who are old friends, um, that, that we are all puzzled about them. And I'm just going to give you the example of justice, that we all know that justice matters. If you imagine living in a society with no justice all the time, then that is an absolute nightmare. At the same time, even though we all are signed up to that in theory, both societally and internationally and in our personal relationships, we find it very difficult to achieve. And if we are involved in a particular justice issue ourselves, we are always inclined to give ourselves the benefit of the doubt. And even though we all know we do that, uh, we, still, we still do it anyway. And so justice is something we all say yes to, but we all find it difficult. And I would say the same about the others, so I'm not going to take the time to spell that out, except perhaps to say about freedom and truth that freedom is, again, something that most human beings cross-culturally would say, yeah, that's a good thing, but what exactly it consists in and what we are free from and what we are free for, these are actually much harder to figure out, even theoretically, and harder still to figure out in practice. And truth, well, if you're in a contemporary university, as you know, in the words of a famous book, truth is stranger than it used to be. Truth is not simply the sum total of agreed facts but actually truth is a more slippery and odd concept than that. And we all know truth matters. One of the reasons we're at a university is because this is a place where people ask the big truth questions. And yet, in the things that really matter, it still slips through our fingers. How do we explain this? And how, as humans, do we go about achieving them? In both cases, humans tell stories. Humans are basically storytelling creatures. And you can look at the big stories that have been told. And my colleague has mentioned particularly some of the great philosophical stories from Aristotle and then from the Stoics, who tell a story about the way the world is and a story about the way humans are within that world. And it seems to me that each of the great stories told by the great philosophers and the great religions is, in a sense, a way of constructing a narrative within which we can make some sort of sense of justice, freedom, truth, and all the others. And for me, the Christian story makes an interesting kind of sense. It isn't that the Christian story gives you a knockdown answer to all those questions so that there's nothing more to think about. Far from it. In my experience, the Christian story raises fresh questions in all sorts of directions. But as it does so, it plugs into the ancient Israelite story, which comes through in first century Judaism, in which, unlike the Epicureans in one direction, unlike the Stoics in another direction, they believe that heaven and earth are meant for one another. They go together. They, they, they are supposed to be complementary. They are the two parts of a good creation. And that all human beings living on earth in the imminent world are nevertheless aware in some way or other of things which don't really work if all you have is an imminent world, and hence they are looking for something different and beyond, and yet something which isn't very far away from any of us. And within the Jewish world and then within the Christian world, this is talking about a God who makes a world, a God who wants human beings to live in that world wisely because they bear God's image, and a God who will one day call time on the whole thing by producing a renewed creation in which justice and truth and peace and freedom and all those other things will actually be enhanced and 
completed in some sense which it's actually hard for us to describe, but then many important things are hard for us to describe. So that within all of that, the Christian vision which I hold of the place of human beings is of being image bearers, because if you're in the ancient pagan world, you build a temple to your God, and the last thing you put into that temple is an image of the God, so that the influence of the God may be there in the world, and so that the world may see who the true God is through the image. And this is the picture which we have from the book of Genesis, right on through, radically renewed in the New Testament, that God made a sort of temple called heaven plus earth, called the cosmos, the creation, and put into that temple an image, namely human beings, so that we are supposed to be reflecting God into the world and reflecting the world back to God. And in the Jewish story, this is a project in search of an ending. And in the Christian story, the climax to that, um, not a conclusion exactly, but certainly a climax, comes with Jesus of Nazareth, who is the true image, the truly human being, and who in mysterious ways is also the living embodiment of Israel's creator God. And when Jesus does what he does, particularly his launching of God's kingdom, his death and his resurrection, and his sending of the Spirit, then people are energized in a new way, not so much for Aristotle's happiness, though that's really important as a kind of a byproduct in the Christian language that might be part of what is meant by joy, not quite the same thing as eudaimonia happiness, but not too far away, but it, we are energized in order to be genuine human beings, which is to reflect the living God into the world, and in the terms of praise and worship, to reflect God back to the world. And as I reflect on that larger story and see how it relates to or bounces off the other story that people have stories people have told from time to time, I find a deep satisfaction both in being part of that narrative myself and in observing the way in which at least it reframes and points towards an answer to those questions about justice, spirituality, relationships, beauty, freedom, and truth, and power.